Are you looking for ways to strengthen your marriage? Would you like to raise children you enjoy being around? Do you long for a peaceful, orderly home that's a blessing to everyone who comes through its doors? Then you've come to the right place. I'm Jennifer Flanders, a Bible-believing, homeschooling mother to 12 and host of the Loving Life at Home podcast. Join me as we discover what God's Word has to say about marriage, motherhood, and minding the things that matter most. Hello, friend. Thank you for joining me for another episode of Loving Life at Home. Today, we're talking about gospel-centered parenting. I frequently hear from moms who have many of the same questions I had as a young mother. They want to know, how can I pass on my faith to my children? And what does it mean to train them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord? How can I protect them from bad, soul-crushing influences? And how can I make sure that they love and honor God their whole lives? I've gotten many more questions in that same vein, but this will be a good start. As Christian moms, we'd all like to raise godly children who love the Lord with all their heart and honor Him and all they do, right? We want to proclaim with John, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. That's 3 John 1, 4. Well, the good news is the Bible has a lot to say about raising children, and it has even more to say about living out your own faith in genuine, consistent ways. Ways, which is one of the best things we can do as parents to point our children to Jesus. So today I want to talk about five things we can do as parents to raise our children in a gospel-centered way. The first one is to provide an example. Practice what you preach. When my husband was in residency at Parkland Hospital in Dallas, he got tons of experience. He saw everything at Parkland. But their mantra there was to see one, do one, teach one. Because the fact is, You can't teach it until you learn it yourself. And if you haven't learned it well enough to teach it, then you probably haven't learned it well enough. Actions speak louder than words, and you've got to practice what you preach. I love that passage in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 18 through 23. It says, You shall lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul and bind them as a sign upon your hand that they may be as frontlets between your eyes and you shall teach them to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk in the way, when you lie down and when you rise up and you shall write them upon the doorpost of your house and upon thy gates. And it goes on from there. It's just a beautiful, beautiful passage. But if you'll pay attention to the order it comes in first, you store up God's word in your own heart and soul, and then you teach it to your children. You can't pass on what you don't yourself possess. So I would recommend that you root yourself in the word of God. We know it is profitable for reproof and correction and training in righteousness. So read your Bible, memorize it, Meditate on it. Put it into practice and examine everything you read or hear or see, whether you're in church or reading books or blogs or listening to podcasts or on social media or the internet in general. Examine all those things in the light of God's eternal, invaluable Word. Then also consider the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Take stock. Are these fruits evident in my life, in my daily interactions with my family? Are these the qualities that my children and my husband see in me, whether I'm happy or stressed, whether I'm on time or running late? God's Word and our service to Him should constantly be at the forefront of our minds, pouring over the Word, memorizing it, meditating on it, discussing it, and weaving it into conversations, encouraging people with it, praying it, singing it, applying it to our everyday lives, and building our lives upon it. You cannot pass on what you do not possess yourself. So delight yourself in God, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Then my second bit of advice would be to prepare the soil. You want to nurture the things you want to grow. When I first decided that I wanted to take up flower gardening, I was living in Mosquito and I ordered 200 bulbs and perennials to plant in front of my house. Uh, Now, here in Tyler, our soil is sandy loam. I can bury my arm to the elbow and grow just about anything in this soil in East Texas. But in Mesquite, our house is on black clay. It would dry out and crack and our foundations would crack. It just was hard as a rock. So when I got ready to plant my bulbs, I went out there and chiseled a bunch of holes in that rock hard ground, dropped a bulb into each one of them, 
and never gave them a second thought until the following spring when only six of them came up and only three of 200 bloomed. Now, given what experience has since taught me about gardening, the surprising thing was not that 194 of those bulbs never came up, but that the half dozen showed any signs of life at all, given the neglect that they had suffered. In the same way, in parenting, planting the seed of God's Word in our children's heart is not a one-time and done proposition. It's not a one-time thing. You do it over and over again. You cultivate the soil. You break up the fallow ground. You water and fertilize as needed, just like I should have done with those bulbs in my garden. You pull weeds as they come up and don't wait for them to grow big and take over. You nip them in the bud. We want the Word of God implanted to have the best chance of taking root and bearing fruit in the lives of our children. Mark 10, 14 tells us, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. We want to bring our children to Christ. We want to bring them to God's word. We want to bring them to the Lord in prayer. We don't relinquish that duty to Sunday school or vacation Bible school in the summer or youth programs or private Christian schools. All those things have their place, but they're a poor substitute for godly parents living out their faith and discussing it with their children day in, day out, as they sit in the house, as they walk in the way, as they lie down, as they rise up. We want to teach them precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little, as it says in Isaiah 28.10. This idea is also repeated in Isaiah 28.13, but to no effect because the children of Israel ignored all that good teaching and hardened their hearts, which is a good reminder to us because apart from God's grace, nothing else we do is going to have the desired effect in the lives of our children, which is why We need to do my next point. Pray, 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 pray. Pray without ceasing. Parenting is a work of grace. So pray that God will soften your children's hearts. Pray that He will draw them to Himself from an early age. Pray that He will fortify them against temptation. Pray that He will give us as parents wisdom as we raise them. As wonderful as it would be to hear that our children are walking in the truth, I have to warn you, if you make that your goal, you're setting yourself up for frustration. If you make it your goal, what your children do with the gospel and with their faith, uh, that is something that you don't have any control over. Once our children leave our home, their behavior is up to them and their relationship to God is between them and God. And so rather than making it my goal that my children do a certain thing, I want my goals to be rooted to things that I actually have control over. So I make it a matter of prayer. Yes, I beg God to draw my children to faith and to keep them on the straight and narrow. But my goal is to honor God in the way I raise them. That's something I do have control over. I want to be obedient to the scriptures that tell me how to instruct them. I want to pray Pray that God will use my life as a means of grace to draw my children unto Himself and that He will graciously make up for my lack and that He'll not let me be a stumbling block to them in any way. But I can't make them Christians any more than I can make the sunrise or the grass grow. There's no fail-safe recipe or formula in parenting. You're not going to find, or if you do, it's faulty. You can't say, if I combine all these ingredients, homeschooling and once a week church and Bible reading and devotions with a family that uh, I'm going to get this guaranteed result. It's not a recipe. It's not a guarantee. But we want to do our part to be faithful and to do the things that He's impressed upon our hearts to do. So yes, all those things we should be doing, but with the goal of being obedient to Him and our children's obedience is between them and God. That's not something we can control with our actions or the way that we raise them. So back to the prayer, 1 Thessalonians 5.17 tells us pray without ceasing. Colossians 4.2 tells us continue in prayer. Some translations say devote yourself to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Philippians 4.6 says to be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So I'm not saying that we should worry, um, that our children will reject the faith, but we need to recognize that that is a possibility and it will not mean that our work is in vain because we can still hear from the Lord, well done, thou good and faithful servant. We want to live in a way that points our children to Jesus and pray that God will draw them to himself, but 
recognize that it is a work of grace from beginning to end. Uh, I love what my friend Abby Halberstadt says. Prayer should be our frontline defense against Satan's schemes, not our last resort. Don't wait until you're desperate. Pray now. I have lots of prayer guides on my website, Loving Life at Home. I'll, I'll link to a page full of them in the show notes. I have prayers based on scripture that you can pray over your unborn child, over your children, over your teens, over your adult children. I have a variety that are taken straight from Scripture so that you know that you're praying the heart of God. Uh, He says that he desires that none perish, but all would come to repentance. So we can certainly pray for our children to be drawn to repentance, knowing that that is God's heart for mankind, is that they would come to repentance. I love the quote, pray hardest when it's hardest to pray. Some people think that means to pray when you're in the deepest trouble, but I don't know about you, but when I've never found it hard to pray when I'm in a pickle. Prayers come fast and easy when I need God to do a miracle or get me out of a jam. For me, the hardest time to pray is when I'm exhausted or excited or angry or anxious or annoyed or busy or distracted or behind. Being busy and distracted behind those last few are particularly hard ones for me. That's one reason it so inspires me to read the thoughts and perspectives of great prayer warriors such as George Mueller, who said, four hours of work after an hour of prayer will accomplish more than five hours of work without prayer. Or Martin Luther, who said, work, work from early until late. I have so much to do that I have to spend the first three hours in prayer. I don't know about you, but when I have a lengthy to-do list, that is not my first thought, is that, oh my goodness, I have so much to accomplish, I better get on my knees for three hours. I really admire that, and we probably would do better if we did that. Charles Haddon Spurgeon says, we should pray when we're in a praying mood, for it would be sinful to neglect so fair an opportunity, and we should pray when we're not in a proper mood, for it would be dangerous to remain in so unhealthy a condition. So, when is it hardest for you to pray? Let's work harder at remembering at that moment to pray for God's strength and comfort and wisdom and grace. Then, my fourth tip would be to pick your battles. Be strategic and pay attention. There are some things like hairstyles and food choices. Don't make that your hill to die on. I am so appreciative of my own mom. When I was growing up, I really could not stand this taste of green beans. I would gag on them every time I tried to swallow a forkful. And so I didn't. Anytime my mom served green beans, she would just encourage me, just take a bite and see if you like it. Someday you might find that you do, you know. But she didn't force the issue. And if I put it in my mouth and gagged and spit it right back out, she was fine. She just wanted me to taste it in case. And I'm so thankful that was her approach because I kid you not, green beans are now one of my very favorite vegetables. And I don't think that would have been the case if she had forced it when I was little, but she didn't. I had a friend whose mother felt like whatever he didn't eat at breakfast was going to be served to him again at lunch. And she made that her hill to die on. And every time I think of that poor kid looking down at his soggy bowl of cereal that has been saved over since breakfast, I just am so, so grateful that I did not have a mom that did that to me. I would encourage you not to view the spiritual training of your children as behavior modification. The heart is so much more important, and our utmost concern should not be what others think of us or of our children, but where each of us stand individually before God. That has to be our primary concern. There's no room for pride or for thinking, my child would never do that. Remember the verse, let the little children come into me and do not hinder them. How do we hinder them? One way is by failing to practice what we preach and live lives of integrity, but another is by being more concerned with the outward behavior than with the heart issues. And if you're picking your battles based on what the neighbors might think, then you're probably picking the wrong battles. Don't let your own pride dictate what issues get addressed in your own children, or you'll end up spending all your time just whitewashing tombs, both theirs and your own. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart, and behavior modification is not enough in and of itself. We have to prioritize heart issues. I mentioned earlier about food preferences and hairstyles not being a hill I want to die on. I learned that the hard way. When my firstborn got to be a teen, he decided he didn't want his hair cut as short 
as I had been cutting it, and we really butted heads over his haircut one afternoon. I remember it vividly. He had a friend there with him, and the friend wore his hair a little bit longer, and I usually cut the boy's hair once a month, the first part of every month. I was out in the garage cutting everybody's hair, and it was Jonathan's turn to get his hair cut, and he was uh, resistant to that idea, and I should have just let it pass and, and let him go a month between haircuts. That was not a big deal, and I can see that now. But at the time, I could not see that. I thought, what is this son of mine doing questioning how how we do things in our family, you know? And I just was ready almost to disown him because he would not cooperate and, and submit to this haircut that I wanted to give him. And that was so foolish on my part. And I have since repented. His younger brothers benefited from the fact that I learned that lesson early on with him. But uh, later, I had a son that was growing his hair out. He was playing basketball at the time, and he had to wear a headband just to keep it out of his eyes so he could see to shoot. And he was really, really good at basketball and ended up going to nationals. And in this homeschool league of kids with crew cuts, he was the only one with a headband. So he was known as the the guy with the headband. And he was really good at what he did. And he ended up making the all-star team. And so we get home from nationals, and it's about a month before he has to go back for the all-star team. And he gets home and he says, this hair's driving me crazy. Mom, uh, can I get a haircut? And I said, are you sure you want to cut it? Because you're known as the guy with a headband. You'll go back to nationals. They won't even recognize you or know who you are. So uh, why don't you wait until after nationals and then I'll cut it? You know, it was already way over his ears on his collar. And so he said, oh yeah, you're probably right. And he grew it out um, even further and and wore his headband at nationals. Everybody knew who he was. We came home and I said, okay, are you ready for that haircut? And he says, oh, no, I think I'm going to keep it. And I'm thinking, oh, why, oh, why did I not cut it when I had that opportunity? But he grew that hair out so long he was wearing a man bun. And he then had a new goal of growing it like 14 inches so that he could donate it to Locks of Love, which is what he ended up doing, which is a great thing. But I just, you know, with this man bun on top and running in conservative circles, it would have been very easy to concern myself with what are people going to think instead of his heart issue, which his heart was really in the right place. And there was no rebellion whatsoever there with his man bun or his, his lack of a haircut. He is such a stellar guy. And by that time, I realized that this was not, again, a hill to die on. And it didn't really matter what others thought. If his heart was right before God, it was perfectly fine for him to do what he was doing. So it makes me think of Luke 16, 15. Jesus said to them, Ye are they which try to justify yourselves before men, but God knows your heart. For that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. And so, again, We don't want whitewashed tombs. We want to get to the heart issues. And if the heart is in the right place, then that's our primary concern. The Bible's clear about some issues. No stealing or lying or cheating. Those things should not be tolerated. And they need to be dealt with swiftly and consistently and decisively. But in matters of taste and opinion, what they eat and the clothes that they wear, as long as they're modest, you know, it doesn't matter that they aren't necessarily the style that you would pick for them how they style their hair, what electives they take in school. There's a lot of leeway and room for grace in matters such as these, especially as they move closer and closer to adulthood. We don't want to have this adversarial relationship with our kids. We want to have a listening ear. We want to be fully present when they engage with us. An older woman once told me her her son was my age. She was significantly older than I was. One of her biggest regrets is that she wishes she had been a better listener and had been more available to her son when he was a teen and wanted to talk or needed to talk. So communication, listening, we need to ask questions. We want to respond, don't react when our kids tell us things. Uh, James one nineteen gives good guidance here. Let everybody be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. That's especially important as they become teens. We need to anticipate their questions, allow their questions. Is part of growing up that they start to question things, and we need to consider those questions and 
answer them to the best of our abilities and uh, admit when we don't know the answer and seek it together. It's a natural process of our children's making their parents' faith their own. So we shouldn't feel threatened when they start asking questions or act overly defensive because if our faith can't stand up to scrutiny, it's not worth having. Each of our children we've seen go through this process of transferring and taking ownership of the faith that we've tried to instill in them. Again, knowing that it's God that is working in their hearts. We we can teach them. We can, you know, you can bring a horse to water, you can't make them drink. And we can provide a good example and pray for them and listen to them and answer their questions. We can do all those things, but we can't actually germinate that faith in their heart. That is a work of the Holy Spirit. And so we have to trust that He is going to complete the work that He started in the hearts of our children when He put them in our home, in the home of Christian parents that that desire them to know the Lord. Then my fifth point would be to be persistent and well-doing. Remember that parenthood is a marathon, not a sprint. Fix your eyes on the finish line, not on what everyone else is doing. Galatians 6, 9 tells us, let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not lose heart. Matthew eleven twenty eight and 29 reads, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Philippians 1, 6, I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. And then Hebrews 12, 1 through 2, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin that so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, not only our faith, but our children's faith as well, and who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We can faithfully do all these things as parents, but they will be fruitless apart from God's blessing. There is no guarantee. There is no recipe that promises if you put in the right amounts to the right ingredients, you'll get the desired results. Godly parenting is often the means of grace that God uses to draw children unto himself, but our children still have free will, and that means that they might reject everything that we've tried to teach them. Joel Belts with World Magazine had a great quote that reminds us that God's purposes are not dependent upon our actions. He said, as soon as you start thinking that God needs your effort to achieve his ends, you've quit being faithful. So why even bother? Because the reverse is also true. If we view God's ability to accomplish his purposes independently as an excuse for ignoring his clear commands to us as parents, then we're also being unfaithful. And that is why I do what I do in parenting my children. I do it because God commanded me to do it. I do it to be obedient and to steward well the responsibility He gave me when He entrusted me with these 12 eternal souls. I do it because I want to run with endurance the race that has been set before me, and I long to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant, when I reach the finish line. And I would encourage you to do the same. Fulfill your parenting responsibilities cheerfully and consistently and bathe all of your efforts in fervent prayer, then leave the results to God. Thanks so much for listening today. If you have a question you'd like to hear covered on this podcast, message me on Instagram at Flanders underscore family or contact me through my website, lovinglifeathome.com. Before you go, if you've been encouraged by something you've heard on the show, do me a favor and forward the link to a friend or head over to Loving Life at Home on Apple iTunes to subscribe and leave a written review of the show. Your doing so will help others find me so they can listen too. Until next time, I pray the Lord will bless your efforts to build a loving home life centered on Him.